We're talking today with David Mitchell of Sholo, Arizona. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, start us off with some background on yourself. Uh, I was born in a small town, basically a farming community, Auburn, Indiana. Uh, the industry we had there was all centered around the automotive industry out of Michigan for the most part. Okay. Uh, what year were you born? 1949. Okay. Um, and then did you grow up there? I grew up there, graduated from high school. And what year did you graduate? 19, 1967. Okay. Uh, ventured off to Purdue University. Uh, af after the first semester of my uh, sophomore year, uh, they felt that I was probably the smartest person in the world and I didn't need to come back. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I pretty much blew it off. Okay. But I wasn't ready for college. I didn't know that. But I wasn't. Now, why had you gone to college to begin with? It was primarily my my mom and dad's wish, because mm -hmm. neither one of them actually had an opportunity to go to college, even though my father should have. He was a brilliant man, but so what, what kind of work had your father done? He was he was a journeyman electrician. Okay. All right. Uh, now, so when do you actually when do you get drafted then? April third, nineteen sixty nine. Okay. At that point, I mean, how much did you know about Vietnam and all that? Uh, some. Not a lot. But the interesting thing is, is my father was drafted, inducted into the Army April 3rd, 1942. Same day. There. So, um, it, was, it was an ongoing thing, Vietnam. But remember, I was born and raised in a small town, Indiana, right? The, uh, Fort Wayne was the biggest city within any distance. There were almost, you know, there were no racial issues to speak of at the time, 1969. When I went to college, it was my first induction, introduction into the fact that some kids hated their parents, mm -hmm. right? I, I never heard that before. Are you kidding me? Not in Auburn. Didn't happen. Yeah. So, uh, but after my stellar performance at Purdue, I pretty much figured out what the uh, inevitability was going to be in the near future. So, all right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and now I guess while you were at Purdue, I mean, did you kind of was there a kind of counterculture on campus there? Did you have no. hippies or things like that that you noticed? No. Purdue, Purdue was a was an overgrown Auburn. You know, it was a farming. Primarily an agriculture school, right. right? And the only thing they cared about was soybeans and corn and wheat. And they had some other good programs. Engineering is what I started in. And uh, they had a wonderful engineering program. I just didn't excel at it at all. all right. Okay. So where now? So we've made it now to April 69. Now you're um, reporting for basic training. So where do you go? We left Auburn at like 4 o'clock in the morning. He took a bus to Indianapolis. From there, we were we were uh, assigned whatever we were going to do. Some of them went to the Marines. Uh, it was a scary thing for them, poor boys. But uh, and I ended up in Fort Knox. Did you notice how it was determined who went to the Marines? I think I've got a pretty good idea. They never said specifically, but I think a lot of it had to do with criminal records, speeding violations, drug and alcohol problems. Um, a, a brief pass in front of the camera. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so basically, so it wasn't a system like it was every third guy goes to the Marines or anything like that. There were just certain lucky people. They might like to think that's what they thought it was, but that's not what it was. Okay. So where did you go for basic training? Fort Knox, Kentucky. Okay. Uh, what kind of reception do you get when you show up there? It was typical of everything else. I can remember that we didn't get there till late in the evening, right? And so they fed us and, and you know, we had our first police call and basically the uh, drill sergeant said, boys, here's the first lesson you got to learn. If God didn't put it there, it's got to go. I mean, you police the barrack area, right? Mm -hmm. Cigarette buzz, paper, chewing, it didn't matter what it was. And then we were issued our, our fatigues and boots and, you know, uh, Army only has two sizes, too big and too small. All right. Uh, and then 
How easy or hard was it for you to adjust to army life? It was, it was pretty easy for me from the standpoint that I grew up working, right? I mean, I worked a lot on the farm, so you get up at dawn, you go to bed at, at dark, uh, and in between it was whatever. Uh, probably the, the thumb on discipline was uh, probably the hardest thing for me to get used to. I was not used to it. I pretty much was given a lot of freedom and flexibility when I was growing up. Now, were there other guys you were training alongside who were having trouble? A lot of them. What I mean, kinds of things? They were, one thing, they came from broken families, some of them. They didn't know how to work. They didn't, they were overweight. They didn't want to exercise. They had a bad attitude, right? I mean, I went into it with, with the outlook of this. You know, it's inevitable this is what's going to happen, so you might as well make the best of it. You screwed up college, so you got another chance to do something in your life that isn't a blooming failure. So that's what I did. I, you know, I tried. I tried to do the best I could. I maxed my PT test. Mm -hmm. You know. All right. Uh, and then, and what impression did you have of your drill instructors? I hated them. Right until I had got my first firefight in Vietnam. Right. So what was it that, what did you recognize when that, once you had that first firefight? What was it that they had done for you? They made you be aware of what you were going to face and experience and how to deal with it. I, the hardest part about, and, I, and, and I, I was talking with Bob or somebody last night, you know, anybody who was in Vietnam in a firefight or in Vietnam in the infantry who professed not to be scared is not telling the truth. Now, the fear, as soon as you started that firefight, the fear went away, right? And then when it was over, you gradually moved back into that, well, here we go again, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're in the middle of a firefight, you just, you do what you gotta do, you know? And there was, there was a saying that was in the 101st, at least in my unit, probably his too, when somebody got killed, okay, this is one this is one of the hard things to learn. When somebody in your unit was killed in a firefight, they went from an asset to a liability. Okay? And there was a phrase that was coined, or at least was there when I was there, it said, Don't mean nothing, drive on. Mm -hmm. And it took people a long time to understand what that really meant. And that is a lot of where survivor's remorse comes in because you used to have to step over dead guys, your brothers, to go finish the mission. And you always had it in the back of your mind that we'll come back and take care of you. We'll come back and get you, but right now, we have got time. All right. So let's roll back now. So you get, you get through your basic training. Yeah. And how long was that? Eight weeks, I think. Okay. Uh, what's your next stop? Uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, AIT. All right, you got the advanced individual training, uh, and describe what that program was like. It was hot, <laughs> it was sweaty, it was July, and it was uh, just a step above what basic training was. Basic training was basically a, a fitness training program with a, you know some tactics thrown in here and there. AIT was a little more advanced. They assumed that you'd lost the weight you were going to lose and develop the muscle you were going to get. And so it was more of a tactical process, if you will. All right. So how were you spending your time? Uh, working in the field. Okay. We did a lot of physical therapy. Or uh, training. I mean, physical yeah. training. Well, physical the therapy, therapy too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we, we spent a lot of time on, on the rifle range. We spent a lot of time uh, uh, going through basically map skills and, and understanding what we had available to us as an infantry soldier uh, in the field what what at, you know what we had we had machine guns we had aircraft we had jets we had you know 
pistols. We had bayonets. Thank God we never had to use those, except to kill the spider. Um, and, and so it was just a continuation on with that. Okay. And how much of it was geared for Vietnam? Every bit of it was geared to it. The problem at the time I went through it, a lot of the tactics were World War II tactics, oh, tactics and they weren't really jungle warfare types. So. What would be the difference between those? Uh, basic, one of the basic differences was we never, unless you were going to court an off an area, you, you never got online and attacked, right? In Vietnam, we walked single file, much separation, point man, slack man, mm -hmm. rear guard. Um, so it was not like we were fighting in the trenches in Germany mm -hmm. or storming the beaches in, you know, in uh, France or wherever they were. It was, you had to figure out how to tactically move in the jungle mm -hmm. environment. Right. And that's what, when I went to NCO school, that we learned. Okay. Uh, how was it that you wound up going to NCO school? I volunteered. Okay. And how does that, how does it work within the Army? If they want, they want people, and what, do they put out a call, or? They ask for basically anybody that was interested, and then they, I think, I'm going to guess, I, I think they do a review of your performance. Because in every aspect of the military, there's always a performance rating that goes along with it. Sometimes you know what it is, sometimes you don't. Okay. Now, was this at Fort Polk where they did that? Or? No, Fort Benning. Ben okay. No, but I mean in terms of when they were... Oh, yes, it was, a, it was at, right at the end of AIT. Okay. All right. And so what motivated you to uh, sign up for that? Uh, I'll be quite honest with you. The more I could learn, the better information I could have. The, the better I was going to have a chance of coming home from Vietnam. Okay. And that was basically the motivation. All right. Uh, so now that so Fort Benning now becomes your next stop. Yep. And describe a little bit what the NCO school was like. It was a, uh, a graduate program in, for us in leadership skills, uh, tactics, because that's what we were being trained for, basically frontline supervision. Mm -hmm. Right? And so it was just, it was a compounding of what you had learned in AIT with the new, more advanced uh, aspects of the training. And I, I found it, it was more uh, designed around Vietnam because almost all of the instructors had been there at least once, if not twice, mm -hmm. sometimes three times. Okay. And so now you were learning to operate differently rather than line up and charge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you still had the fun opportunity of crawling through mud and barbed wire and all that stuff, but that, that that's just part of what we what you still probably do, I don't know. All right. And how long did you spend there? I think that was eight or ten weeks. Okay. And now, uh, once you complete that, do they give you any additional work before they send you to Vietnam? Yeah, we went, then we went back to, I went back to Fort Polk as a training sergeant in a basic training unit. Okay. Or an AIT unit. Yeah. Okay. And what, what were your duties? We were basically uh, uh, what we called them barracks sergeants. You know, you were responsible for everybody in that barracks f to make sure that they were uh, up, trained, you know, disciplined properly, physical train properly and uh, and then you would lead them in a lot of the exercises that you would do so that's where you we developed the hands-on leadership skills that you don't always get uh, by by doing it in a group right so here you're actually giving orders to other people and oh, yeah. having to make them behave you have to I mean it's part of the discipline program okay now, had, when you had gone through BASIC and AIT yourself, and had you noticed those guys, the new sergeants, did they kind of stand out from the other ones? or? I didn't see any of them until AIT. Okay. In BASIC training, everybody that, that our drill sergeants were all uh, uh, 
they're veterans. They're veterans, been in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and uh, they only had one mission in mind, and that was to try to make you get, get you in a position where you come home. All right. Okay. So now you've gone through all of this stuff. So by the time you fin, oh, how long was the stint then at Fort Polk as a trainer? How long did you? Eight stay there? weeks. Okay, so it's another eight weeks. So you basically work with one group. One one. One side rotation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and now, did they give you time off before going to Vietnam? Yeah, I was off thirty day leave, I believe. Okay. And then where do you leave the states from? Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. Uh, and. At this point, did you have orders for a particular unit, or were you just going to be a replacement? We, were, we went to a replacement company in Cameron Bay. All right. Now, uh, how did they get you to Vietnam? On uh, a Flying Tiger Airline. Okay. And do you remember where they stopped? Stopped in Anchorage, Alaska, and Yokota Air Force Base in Japan. Okay. Did you get off the plane in Alaska? Or? Yeah. They were refueling. I got off. It was. When it was pretty brief. I mean, we didn't have a whole lot of time to go to the bar and drink or anything, yeah. so. Uh, but yeah. Okay. All right. So you go through there. Okay. And, and Cameron Bay, you said, is where you landed? Cameron Bay. Okay. Did you come in during the day or at night? During the day. Okay. And what was your first impression of the David, event? what in the hell are you doing here? <laughs> it was hot, and it was just like stepping off the plane in Fort Polk in July. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a stark realization that, uh, and I think Bob had mentioned it, this is it. You can't get back on the plane. They ain't taking you home today, mm -hmm. right? So uh, that was basically it. I mean, you had, an, you had an inkling about what it might be about. Mm -hmm. You didn't really know. Okay. And how long did you spend at Cameron Bay? Well, we were probably there three days, two, three days before we were, we were given our assignment and then uh, we, we were sent up north. Okay. And do you remember anything about how you spent your time in those couple of days there? I don't really. Okay. Like, do you think they just they didn't give you bunker duty or anything like that? No, they didn't give us anything to do initially. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and we went up to the Fubai area in northern i and we went through our in-country training search, yeah. what they called it. Okay, so, so you're 101st Airborne, so you get their Screaming Eagles replacement training. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for... and. A, a newly minted sergeant. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, what was that experience like? Did the training school there do you any good? Uh, not really. The best, the best training that I got in my entire career in the Army was the first week in the field with the sergeant that I was replacing, okay. Jerry Bull. All right. Uh, so what unit do you join? Delta Company, 2nd to 501st. All right, and uh, where were they when you joined them? They were just coming off a of stand down, mm -hmm. so we were getting ready to deploy. Okay, and um, what kind of reception do you get when you joined them? Like any other brand new cherry comes into the country, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, the sayings where, you know, give it a week or so and, and you'll quit pissing stateside water and, and, uh, the only thing they didn't tell me that you figure out pretty quick, you don't wear underwear in Vietnam unless you want to live with rainwater. Okay. Now, uh, when you first join the unit, do you get any responsibility or are you just supposed to watch? I just basically spent my time with the sergeant I was replacing. Okay. Yeah. It was not. Like I didn't do anything, but it was basically at his dis direction and discretion what he asked me to do initially. Okay. Uh, so now when you go out in the field, do you fly out, walk out? We're, we were air mobile. We flew in helicopters. Okay. Uh, and so you first go out in the field with the What do you remember about that first week? Um, I remember that there's own, the only mountains in Vietnam go up. They don't go down. You climb to the top of one, they fly you to the bottom of another. Uh, on my birthday, April 8th, uh, I got that Archon medal for Valor. And then on April... Well, how did that happen? It was in a firefight that that uh, we, we actually had gotten ambushed. Mm -hmm. And we just, my, my squad was the one that was in walking point. 
for the platoon, and mm -hmm. so we we maneuvered and 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 removed the threat, if you will. Um, and then on April fifteenth, I got my first purple heart, and that was on a place that you've heard of before called Reappeal, because mm -hmm. we were Delta Company. Second, the 501st was actually the swing battalion for the 101st Airborne. What that meant was that wherever there was trouble, someone in that unit would go. Mm -hmm. Delta Company had happened to be selected as the swing company for the swing battalion, mm -hmm. at least while I was there. So uh, Bravo Company was on Rio Pill and they were in a bit of a bind and so we went in to try to help them. And so what happened to you? I got shot. Well, shrapnel, actually. Okay. Yeah. And do you know what it was from? Was it mortar or RPG? Or it was an RPG. Okay. And when you're in one of these firefights, I mean, do, you, do you see the enemy at all or just... Sometimes, but not very often. And how long do these things last? They could last anywhere from 30 seconds to 15 minutes. Basically, uh, as Bob had explained earlier, trail watchers, a lot of times they were there only to delay you, right? So they'd fire a magazine or two and then they were gone. Because they knew what the Americans would do, right? We would set up a, a defensive position, we'd fire, if their, their whole intent was to hit somebody. Mm -hmm. That way you had to stop, set up a perimeter, call in a medevac, whatever. And they knew that's what we'd do. And so a lot of times it was, we were moving into a position where you, they might have set up a camp or a base camp or a cache of ammunition or whatever. And so they wanted time to move all that stuff out of the way cause, because they just sometimes knew. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it was interesting mm -hmm. sometimes. And how badly were you hurt? Uh, not really all that bad. Did you stay in the field or go yeah. back? Oh, yeah. yeah. I still get shrapnel on my back from that. Okay. Not big pieces, but I still get it. All right. Uh, now, did that get infected or did you have other problems with it? Or? No, it was good. We had, a, we had, a, uh, we had one, of, one of the best medics that you could ask for. I mean, he just didn't let you ever uh, not take care of things. Jungle rot. Faisal hex soap and, and gauze pads, scrub it out, and he said, I don't care if you cry, get rid of it, mm -hmm. right? And salt tablets. Back in those days, we took salt tablets. Mm -hmm. And he made you take them every day. Okay. Now, when you got into that first firefight and was happening sort of for real, did that, is that sort of where the training kicked in, or you? It became instinctive at that point based on the training, basically. You know, I mean, one of the first things is you realize is you don't stand up and run towards the enemy in a firefight in the jungle. Mm -hmm. At least I didn't. Maybe the Marines did. Well, it all depended on what their IQ was. But, <laughs> but that was not what you were doing. No, that's not what we were doing. Okay. And now did your um, unit normally function as a platoon or company or what size? Operation? Mostly as a platoon. And about how many men were in the platoon? Probably around 18 to 20. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what was physically there. Yeah. It's not supposed to be that small. No. You know, it's supposed to be more like 45 to 65. Mm -hmm. But uh, attrition and uh, lack of replacements just over time dwindled what we, what what was available for us. Okay. And did you stay with the same unit the whole time you were in Vietnam? I did, okay. yes. And so how much turnover did you see? A lot. Here? A lot. Uh, being swing battalion and swing company, we were in contact a lot. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily record firefights and stuff, but a lot. And so you get a guy that gets wounded when he goes out, you don't know he's coming back or right? Mm -hmm. And there was just the repetitive turnover from people derosing right. and going home. I mean, it was just an, uh, an evolutionary type thing that that's what happened. Yeah. 
Now part of the logic of all of that was supposed to be that you always have a certain group of experienced people in the field and the old guys train the new guys and you maintain your effectiveness. Is that how it actually worked? It was intended to work that way. Uh, a lot of the time it did. Um, the, some of the hardest things to instill in the new young kids, and I know you've heard this before from probably a lot, and I was not very old, I was only 21, but I'd been there for a while, right? Um, I had a lieutenant, uh, Frank Bass, and his, his philosophy was this. Well, number one, he was a hard stripe and was promoted to lieutenant. Mm -hmm. In your rucksack, if you couldn't throw it, shoot it, or eat it, it didn't go. Mm -hmm. No radios, no cameras even. All right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can have an air mattress, but I get it first. And he slid it. Mm -hmm. He made a great ground cloth, but no, couldn't hold any air in it, right? No smoking at night. No Zippo lighters at night. I mean, it sounded like a Liberty Bell going off. And uh, I don't care how well you cover up with a poncho liner or something. You can still see the glow, but aside from that, I mean, walk down through this casino, you can smell smoke a mile away, a mile away, and it was just a dead giveaway. Well, would the NVA still kind of smell you anyway? Oh, they do. We smell like sour milk. They smell like dead fish to us. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there were different philosophies about how you set up a night defensive position, and that's one of the other things that we ended up teaching our guys, and was taught to, to us, is we never dug in at night. Never, ever, ever. We would stop sometime in the three or four, five o'clock in the afternoon, and change your socks, let your feet, boots dry out, change your t-shirt if you had, were lucky enough to have an extra one, mm -hmm. eat, right? And then we'd send out a patrol uh, to find our night defensive position. And then at night, right at dusk, we would move into that position. But we would have a pre-drill where we had set up at, say, 5 o'clock of where your positions were going to be, who was going to be where, how we were going to cover what, who was going to set out the uh, uh, mechanical ambushes, where we were going to set them. And so we'd move in at dark. I had a friend in first the 501st Charlie Company. They dug in every night, mm -hmm. and I just could never figure out why you wanted to sit there and give away your position with shovels and. So it was the noise issue. It was a noise issue, mm -hmm. and I, I and I have actually gone into areas where uh, that was their philosophy: is they wanted to dig in, and if you if you do a perimeter walk after a firefight or something. You know what an aiming stake is, right? Mm -hmm. An aiming stake is something that the NVA will set up outside of a position where they know where it's at. So right at pre-dawn or wherever it is, that's where they would uh, uh, focus their fire on. And they would use it for their mortars too. All right. Uh, and so I guess, kind of, take us through, I mean, that next, I mean, there's sort of several months there where I mean, did you go in and out of the Ripcord area, kind of April, May, June, July? We were we were in that basic AO mm -hmm. almost the entire time through July. Okay. Uh, we were around Firebase O'Reilly and Granite, uh, Henderson, uh, and it was. It, like our company commander would say when we did when we would get together, he said, "You guys don't have to go find these guys. They know where you are. Mm -hmm. They'll find you. You don't have to go find them." And pretty much he was right. But the thing that kept us alive, most of us, and that company commander was Captain Chris Strop, mm -hmm. um, was he said, "We will always do the unexpected." Right. Mm -hmm. We will only walk on trails when there is no other way to do it, period. And uh, he, he was, it was his second, second two years with the 25th Infantry before, so. All right, now, um, 
elements of, of your battalion got into a, a couple of fairly ugly fights, and I believe it was Straub's company that wound up in a place called Hill 805. That's where we were. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about that action? Yeah, I can. Um, there were three basic hills that that were strategic points around Rip Court. Mm -hmm. Uh, 902, 1000, and 805. They were just strategically placed with access to Ripcord. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was on April 12th. Sounds right. We, we were in the uh, O'Reilly AO, mm -hmm. and they actually choppered out a hot meal to us in the field. Only time I ever had one, right? And we looked at each other and we said, this shit ain't good, right? The next day we flew into an LZ uh, below Rip, or below Hill 805, and our orders were to to take 805 and and fortify. Mm -hmm. And we were anticipating an extremely hard fight. We ran into no resistance, mm -hmm. not one, not one bullet was fired until that night. And then for basically from then until the 18th, we got hit every night. We got probed every day. We didn't sleep for those five days or six days. And you just couldn't. We were up all night pulling a basically 100% guard duty because we'd get hit anywhere from 10 at night to 3 in the morning, right? I guess in terms, I think in terms of the chronology, because April twelfth, that's about when Ripcord was originally established. So no, I'm the, I'm sorry, it was like July. July. Yeah, July. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. July. Yeah, right. There we go. So yeah, let's make sure we have. Yeah, that I'm sorry. That. I yeah, right. you're right. But the twelfth, the twelfth thing rang about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So so this is the same time when when Ripcord is essentially under siege, being it was. bombarded. It's the same time when some of the stuff had gone on with Hill One Thousand and sort of nine oh two. Yeah. yeah. And that was a little earlier, but but yours was kind of distinctive because it was how many days running? Did you say up there? Six. Okay. And what do you have in terms of why you were there that long? I've got a suspicion that they had it. Okay. Most of the time we take a hill and we leave it. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean that was just Vietnam, Hamburger yeah. Hill. Uh, the Ladrang Valley, mm -hmm. all of that stuff, it was basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. For this time they took it, we occupied it, and it was an interdiction point uh, to Ripcord because it sat right there and looked right down the throat of it. Matter of fact, half of the fire support we got from Ripcord artillery was basically point blank, blank fire. It was not high angle or anything. Yeah, it was just, just direct them. fire pretty much. Yeah, they right lowered them down, pulled the trigger. Um, and when we were ordered to pull off, Captain Straub didn't want to go. He said, I, I, he's lost 13 guys, well, 11 by, at that time. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't want to give it up. I don't give it up, but he didn't have an option. He just didn't have an option, so. Okay. I guess my impression from reading about it was that he was upset at having to stay there as long as he did and not get out earlier. What he was upset about was staying there as long as he did and not getting the reinforcements that he needed. Mm -hmm. That's what the caveat was, okay. right? I mean, we had lost two lieutenants and in one night. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry Palm, and I forget who the other one is right off the top of my head, but yeah, he was not, I mean, nobody wants to stay in the damn place, same place in Vietnam. Mm -hmm more than a night if you yeah. don't have to. It's just suicidal. Mm -hmm. And it was really evident every night we would get hit. You know, we got hit from three different directions, a different one each time, mm -hmm. but their mortars were pinpoint accurate. Their RPGs were pinpoint accurate. We ate satchel charge after satchel charge after satchel charge. Um, uh, even 122 millimeter rockets they'd hit that hill with pretty accurately. Now did you just kind of keep moving around and changing positions while you were up no, there? No, we were, when we were there, we were there. Okay. Everybody, except for when we had some people killed, mm -hmm. you know, we'd backfill, obviously. Um, but you were dug in there? We were dug in. Okay. Most of the bunkers were actually, in some form, NBA bunkers. Okay. 
that we just reoccupied. But we we improved them and made a, you know, a, we we cut fields of fire so we clear out some stuff a little better so you could actually see. Um, and the other thing was is is they were sneaky little guys, very good at what they did, but if you give them if you give them a bush to hide behind, they'll disappear in it, I, just the way it was. So how did you manage to survive all that time? I don't know. Or the unit itself, I mean, was there... I don't, honest to God, it's just you went every minute of every hour of every day. You just, you know, we would, we would prepare to fight at night, we'd get hit, we'd have that firefight, the next morning we'd do a patrol, you know, they, they were ultimately interested in body count and all that mm -hmm. BS that went along with it. Uh, we'd come back, uh, the log birds would come in and resupply us with ammunition and food and replacements if we could. Uh, if there were guys that were wounded but not bad enough to call a medevac in at night, we'd do that during the day. Um, and so you just re-gear for that night. So basically the enemy would lie low during the day yeah. when I guess we controlled the sky and the air and could see things yeah. uh, and then at night they come out again. Yeah. That's just typical of almost everything that we were in unless you happen to run across a trail watcher or you know if they knew you were there and they wanted to set up an ambush but most of the, most of the incidences we had were either at almost always at first, first light, right before first light. Now, through that time, did you get hit again? Or? Yeah, July 13th. Okay. And it was a, a RPG. Okay. But again, not badly enough to take you off the... I, the if you weren't dead, you didn't leave. That's just what Captain Straw's theory was, you know? All right. So once you, you finally do get off there, I mean, was it quiet? I mean, did they, did they shoot at you as you were leaving? Or? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, when we left 805, we left on, I believe it was the 18th, something like that. And we actually piled up all of our extra munitions, uh, combat lost rifles and some M79s and some ammunition that was left for the recoilless rifle. We just couldn't pack it. Mm -hmm. And we moved off and we left one uh, platoon back and they blew that stuff. Well, as we were moving off, we had what was known as a Kit Carson scout with us. Mm -hmm. And he pulled the pins on his grenades and killed another guy and wounded Captain Stroud. Moving off. And, and so we ended up setting up right above the LZ that we were going to be picked up on. And those were other NBA bunkers that we found, but we had seeded them with CS crystals. Mm -hmm. And, but we spent the night there anyway. And then the next morning when the, when the birds came in to pick us up, they were running they were running off at 805 right towards us, burning up whatever they had, AKs or 51 cows or whatever. All right, uh, you have to explain for, an audience, for the audience, what is a Kit, Kit Carson Scout? It was an NVA soldier that was captured or uh, surrendered it was what was known basically as the Chu Hoi program. And if there was a value or if they were willing to turn, supposedly, mm -hmm. against the North, they would send them off to a school and they would become what was known as a Kit Carson Scout, which meant they would come back and be reassigned to a line unit mm -hmm. and they were supposed to be the eyes and ears and, and know what, what was going on in the jungle in and around that area. Sometime it worked, most of the time it was not real successful. Yeah, and in this case, counterproductive. Counterproductive. But, you know, it's another lesson learned. Okay. So when you finally get out of there, mm -hmm. uh, did they give you uh, any downtime or are you right back in the field again? We went, uh, we went to Eagle Beach for, I think, two days. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what do you do there? Uh, Decompress. Well, the first thing we did is the first. That's the first place I ran into hot running water showers. Mm -hmm. Was at Eagle Beach, and when we went in 
to take a shower, our medic was there with a stack of gauze pads and a bottle of Pfizer Hex soap. And he said, I want to see you guys come out raw. Okay. When we came out, Captain Stroud was there and he handed everybody a bottle of whiskey or whatever they wanted to drink. But the caveat was you had to go sit down in the South China Sea because basically what you were doing is scrubbing off all that jungle rot and stuff, mm -hmm. right? And without that whiskey, you couldn't do it. It would be like torture. Ah, serious. But uh, so we did that for a couple of days. And then, uh, then you know, it was back to business as usual. Okay. Uh, now, by the time you got back, had Ripcord been abandoned by the time you went back in the field? No. It was still all going on. Okay. It was, but we went into, I believe it was Firebase Granite. Okay. I think that's where we went. I don't remember exactly. But I do remember a comment from Fred Spaulding in, in, at some point in time, and he told everybody in the rear, who was by, which was primarily the 506, mm -hmm. that the B-52s were already in the air and they were going to hit, be hit that night. Mm -hmm. Now, if they'd have done that on 902 or 1000, mm -hmm. like they did Ripcord, there probably wouldn't be any safe place, but I don't think that we ever hit them with B-52s. Well, it would have been too close to Ripcord, B-52s. It would have been pretty close, yeah. but, you know. But they had, yeah, and there's usually the sort of minimum distance everybody had to be away. Well, yeah, they want you to be, be five miles away. Do you know how far that is in the jungle? <laughs> well, still, Mom, I think a B-52 strike is 1,000 was so close to Ripcord, that probably it, would be... You, yeah. you're, you're not going to do that. You'll get a flyer. But it's what it, what it would have taken. That's what it would have taken. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, that's what we did to Ripcord, and we did that to Ripcord basically to destroy everything that we had left up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob had, had gone back, and uh, he said it was like it, it was like a ghost town. It was denuded all the way up and down the hills. Yeah. All right. Now after. The Ripcord campaign is over. At the end of July, uh, do things quiet down at all? Yeah, they they got s small skirmishes, right? But they had they had actually uh, actually executed what their new mission was going to be when we uh, rebuilt Ripcord. Mm -hmm. Again, I know I'm a believer that there was another offensive headed in the north, similar to Ted of '68. I mean, they just but they had to change their focus initially. Um, and then not all that much longer after Ripcord, uh, you know, the monsoon seasons mm -hmm. would start. And that's when they did a lot of their resupply and their refortification. And because we didn't spend a lot of time in the field. We pulled people off fire bases. You couldn't resupply them, you know. Um, and so we basically turned whatever we had back over to them, and then the next spring we go get it again. All right. Uh, during the monsoon season, then, how are you spending your time? Wet, cold, muddy, and we were not as deep into the into the mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, we weren't in the flatlands necessarily, but we, would, we still go to pull patrols, but they weren't as deep or as concentrated but it was miserable. It was miserable. And about how many months of that? Seemed like a year, <laughs> but it was probably three or four months of pretty wet. Pretty wet. Okay. And then uh, did you get an R and R in there anywhere? You know what? I was scheduled for an R and R and ended up in the 85th of back, and then I was scheduled for another one and ended up in the 95th of back. And they asked me about another one, and I said, thanks, but no thanks. Okay. Yeah. And these are evacuation hospitals? Yeah. Maybe the thing one's in Da Nang, one's in uh, uh, Fubai. Okay. And why were you going there? Well, I had shrapnel from 805, so mm -hmm. they, they sent me there for two days. Came off of uh, Eagle Beach, and then mm -hmm. I went there. Okay. And then I had uh, cellulitis in my leg, and they had to go in and scrape shrapnel off my shin bone. And... You know, it was two days here, three days there, but no thanks. Don't give me an R&R. &R. I, I don't want it again. I can't afford it. Next one may be dead. All right. Pause this here. Okay. 
All right. Uh, so I was, I was just going to ask uh, at this point, what's morale like in, in the unit during this period now when you don't have a lot of activity or whatever and you're getting rained on a lot? And it was pretty low from an overall morale standpoint. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, most of the problems that people have alluded to in Vietnam, the uh, racial problems, the disorganization, most of that, not all of it, but most of it occurred in the rear. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it occurred in the rear because there just was not enough stuff to do during that period for a lot of people to do it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, our supply sergeant, he could only supply us when the helicopters would fly. If they didn't fly, there wasn't shit to do. Mm -hmm. And so that, and plus there was the, just the building unrest uh, uh, from the racial aspect. The political aspect mm -hmm. was gone through the roof. Yeah, all the stuff from back home comes over. Yeah. I mean, I, my brother was going to Ball State University and he'd send me the Indianapolis Star or whatever it was. And you could go through that paper whenever you got it and you could find a story in favor of the war. You could find a story against the war. You could find a story about apathy. They didn't give a shit, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a, almost every time I ever saw one, it was kind of where it was. Our country, our country you think it's divided now? It was really divided back in the early 70s. Yeah. Maybe this, not as, as vocal about it, but it was divided. Because by the time you finish in Vietnam, I mean, Kent State has happened. Kent State's uh, happened. The William, Woodstock has happened. Yeah, William Cali trial comes up at some point. Me Lai, the news about that comes out. Yep. Uh, all that kind of stuff going on. Uh, but basically, did you spend your time either at forward fire bases or in the field? Was that pretty much where you were? That's all I ever was for the most part. Yeah. Uh, now, aside from your stray Chu Hoi scout, did you ever see much of the Vietnamese themselves? Were there civilians? The, any? the civilians? Yeah. Anytime we were in the rear, we had Mama Sans cleaning the hooches and they had duties around, around the base. So that was basically most of it. If we take a convoy somewhere, we go through Phu Bai or Da Nang, well, not even Da Nang, we went north of there, way, mm -hmm. that you'd see the indigenous people there then. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd be lining the streets and stuff. We were riding a deuce and house, but that was about all. Other than that, it was uh, primarily NVA. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're really not seeing what getting and really acquainted with the local population at all, no. the kind of stuff that you're doing, and not, and not certainly not seeing when you're out in the field. No. There were no villages where we were. I mean, almost virtually none in the mountains. Yeah. I think even a lot of the mountain yard population had moved on or was hiding someplace. They were, they were pretty remote. I mean, they, they were an interesting group. We, we were, were taught about them a little bit, you know, basically they wanted to be left alone. Don't bother me, don't screw with my women, you know, you're welcome to pass through, but don't try to change us, influence us, or whatever. That was just their culture. Right. Okay. Uh, now, are there other particular things that, that stand out in your mind about the time we spent in Vietnam that you haven't brought into the story yet? Y yeah, there's a few things. Um, before I went to Vietnam, I went out to dinner with my mom and dad and my uncle who had fought in the Philippines in World War II as an infantry soldier. And he said, Davey, I'm going to tell you three things that can get you killed. He said, don't ever, ever, ever make close friends. Don't ever think about home and never ask anybody you're in charge of to do something you won't do yourself. And that was a lesson that I tried to pass on to my replacement and anybody that was in my squad. It's just, you know, it just, it filters down. It's a lesson in life learned. I had, in my life, I had three uh, significant events. Vietnam was one, okay? Mary and my wife was two, and uh, the birth of our children. Those were the things, I married my wife June 5th, 1971, shortly after I got home. I was engaged to her before. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the other thing was was patriotism. Her dad, whom I was engaged to, his daughter, was on the draft board when I got drafted. Never said a word. Mm -hmm. Not a word. He was a naval Navy pilot in World War II. So it was the patriotism, but the patriotism and the camaraderie and the respect for each other primarily existed in the field. Mm -hmm. There was not a lot of it in base camp mm -hmm. or in the rear. That's where the division basically, that's where I saw the division right. and experienced it whenever we were back. So. <clears throat> so as far as you were concerned, you'd rather be out in the field? Oh, I, I didn't like the base camp. I didn't like the fire bases. Mm -hmm. You're captive. You know, you're just captive. And uh, at least in the field, you had an opportunity to maneuver and move. And, and in some cases, you had some part of destiny on your side as well as uh, on the enemy side. But on a fire, fire base, it was theirs. Mm -hmm. It was theirs for picking. Yeah. You're a target. You're a target. And you're always going to be a target on a fire base. All right. Uh, now, as you uh, get to the end of your time in Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, are you going to have to go back and stay in the Army in the States, or you be able to get out, or what was the deal for you? I got out. Okay. Now, did you get an early out? I got an early out to go back to school. Okay. And how did that work? I mean, you were supposed to be on active duty for two full years when you're a draftee. Well, yes. Okay. So how does it work that you can get out early? You put in a request for early out to mm -hmm. go for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. School was the primary reason. Okay. And, and, and I know you know this, but you got to realize that back in 1970, 71, we started to really withdraw troops. Mm -hmm. So when you only have a month left or a month and a half left, you know, and it was near the end of the monsoon season, hadn't even begun the spring mm -hmm. uh, uh, build-up process yet. That Hell, they were, they were glad to get rid of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Or it seemed like it at any rate. So it was not at that point that difficult. Okay. So when do you actually leave Vietnam? Uh, January 10th. Okay, 71? 1971. All right. Uh, and now, what was leaving like? Heaven. I mean, I flew, I flew home on the most beautiful airplane in the world. It was a Pan American Stretch DC-8, right? And the pilot we had, uh, I can't speak for everybody else, but there were two things, three things that happened. The crew that was on there, the stewardesses, this was their first flight into Vietnam. Okay. The pilot had been in several times, and so when he took off out of Cameron, when he took off out of Cameron Bay, he tilted to the left so everybody could say goodbye, and then he tilted back to the right so everybody could say goodbye. Oh. Huh? And about as soon as he hit cruising altitude, if there were 250 people in that airplane, I swear there were 240 bottles of whiskey came out of AWOL bags. <laughs> and this, the stewardess was running up and she was in a panic, running up and down the aisle, screaming, you can't do that, you can't do that. And there was a little, uh, he was a black uh, first sergeant. Mm -hmm. he, he grabbed a hold of her and set her down on his knee, he was sitting on the aisle, and he said, honey, just let him go. She said, he said, in about an hour, he ain't gonna have any problem with anybody. <laughs> we landed in, in Yokota Air Force Base in Japan. Mm -hmm. Five of us walked off the airplane. Five. The rest of them couldn't walk if they wanted to. So where'd you uh, re-enter the States at? Fort Lewis. Okay. All right. And then did they discharge you from there? Yeah. Okay. Now, when they did that, did they give you any, tell you anything, watch out for protesters, don't wear a uniform, anything like that? Well, I had to wear a uniform <coughs> to fly military stand. Mm -hmm. Right. But when we, we went into Fort Lewis, and then they always put you in a room and say, if anybody's got any drugs, leave them underneath your seat, and there'll be no prosecution or anything, right? So you go through that, load us on buses, they took us to an orderly room, and we were standing outside milling around. And the company clerk came out and said, there's Sergeant Mitchell here. And I said, oh shit, what did I do now? I said, yeah. 
and they said, well, somebody wants to see you in the back. It was a sergeant that had been in my unit and had come home a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. and he was out processing people. Mm -hmm. I was literally out of the Army in 45 minutes. <laughs> He took me back to his barracks. I got a shower, civilian clothes. He did his thing with those guys. We went out and had a few drinks. Next morning, he gave me a set of his dress greens, took me a seat, got me paid, took me seat time. Mm -hmm. That was it. I was done. Okay. Uh, and then, did you have any trouble getting home? Nope. Don't know nobody hassled you or anything like that. Oh yeah, they did. In in seat tech, there were there were instigators, and you know the problem is. Well, what I saw, most of it was the younger generation mm -hmm. that was, and it's the same thing today about the protests of, of, of some things. They don't know what they're protesting or why. They just mm -hmm. don't. It's just a, the thing, right? Yeah. If, if, if you want to protest a war, go to war. See what it's like. And then come back and protest. But, so... Yeah, there were there was that, but see, I had he had given me a pair of jeans and a shirt and whatever, right, my friend. Mm -hmm. And so when I was on the airplane, I just went to the restroom, and took off all the dress greens, the class A's, put them in my uh, A wall bag, and put civilian clothes on. That was the, when I got to Chicago. That was the end of that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, once you finally get back home, what do you do? Um, I went back to school okay. at a uh, local, at, at a uh, regional campus, mm -hmm. IU Purdue, mm -hmm. and then in June we got married and we moved to West Lafayette and uh, I finished up one semester there and then I just was not comfortable in the big university setting so I ended up transferring to uh, Tri-State University which is a small private mm -hmm. school in Angola. Yep. And uh, I ended up graduating from there with a degree in mechanical engineering. Okay. And then uh, did that became your career at that point? I went to work for Dow Chemical in Midland, Michigan mm -hmm. for five years. Left there and went to Alaska to work for, it was Sohio BP at the time, which ended up being BP Exploration right. uh, for 18 years. And then I bought a spill cleanup business with a, f a friend of mine, and we sold it to a native corporation, moved to Arizona, and went back to work as a maintenance superintendent at the paper mill. And then when they closed it five years ago, I retired. Very good. But that's basically what I did. I, I was in engineering almost all my life. All right. And then, I guess to close here, I mean, to look back at the time you spent in the service, so how do you think that affected you? Uh, it was a life-changing event for me. Uh, to frame it up in, in a few words, my wife told me about five years ago, she said, I haven't told you this, but the boy who went to Vietnam was not the man that came home. I mean, you know, I, it's it put a whole new perspective on things because if you can't fix it, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And don't worry about anything because worries never solve the damn problem in this life. So for you, in a way, it helped you learn how to move forward rather than just... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was a great experience. It was a great experience. Torturous at times, but it was a great experience. It taught you that that you only imagine what your limit is, you have no idea what it is until you find it. And you know, even on Hill 805 with no sleep for five or six days, we never really found our limit. Mm -hmm. Never really found it. All right. That's so that's it. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing the story today. You bet.